my friends today we are going to discuss about our second chapter on solar energy harvesting so before going to start just let us know the what is solar energy so basically like water and air the sun is one of the earth's life support systems providing the heat and light as we know because if there is no sun then our uh, life maybe will become miserable or maybe after certain time we cannot sustain on this earth so solar energy basically is the form of energy relies on the nuclear fusion power from the core of the sun so that means actually the solar energy we are getting from the sunlight itself an hour of solar radiations on earth provides the 14 terawatt years of energy almost the same as the world's total annual energy consumption so from this particular uh, statement you can understand that how much energy basically we are getting from the sun solar energy is a free inexhaustible source yet harnessing it is relatively new idea harnessing means just uh, capturing the solar energy and from capturing the solar energy just convert it into some other energy so that we can utilize this solar energy because as we know that when the sun comes it comes to our whole earth uh, surface so uh, some portions basically we are using but some we are wasting also if we able to capture that particular energy and if we are able to convert that particular energy into some energy so of course that is come onto the renewable energy without less cost maybe we can produce some kind of electricity and also it is a very good for the near future because when our fossil fuels are really really going down so why solar energy in the whole world coal deposits will deplete within next 200 to 300 years and petroleum deposits will deplete in next few decades at the present rate of consumption so of course because uh, whatever the coals we are having under the soil every day we are extracting through mines so of course after certain time that will be finished and whatever the petroleums we are getting from the soil or maybe some extractions from the fossil fuels so basically that uh, petroleums or maybe the coal is having some uh, time that after that we are unable to extract it or maybe it will be gone down or maybe finished so basically that time we have to depend up to on maybe some other technology or maybe other inventions from where we can generate the electricity or maybe the thermal power or maybe some kind of other means. So the huge consumption of the fossil fuels has caused many damages to the environment yes of course because when uh, we are cutting down the trees of course it is creating a lots of problems towards the pollutions as we know that nowadays every years our pollution level is increasing tremendously all over the world and then automatically when we are cutting those trees automatically the land sliding and maybe the uh, season changing is quite obvious which is affecting our day to day life and not only that sometimes it may happen that when we are cutting those trees and then burning so it is creating so many toxic gases into the environment which is also one of the causes for increase into the pollutions. So to reduce this damage we need to concentrate on renewable energy sources and solar energy is the one which is available abundantly yes of course because uh, the sun uh, we can get this kind of energy unless and until up to the life of the whole sun so automatically if we were uh, able to explore this kind of energy from the solar light so automatically uh, at least for next few decades or maybe the next few uh, years uh, at least we can think that we can get the constant energy from preserving this sunlight or maybe from this particular sun. So the most advantage using solar energy is that this is distributed over a wide geographical area because all over the world the sunlight is coming ensuring that developing regions such as India have access to electricity generation at a stable cost for the long term future whatever I have already explained. So now what is the importance of the solar energy why nowadays every people are talking about the renewable energy solar energy or maybe the solar power systems because from this particular uh, table we can understand that how important it is 
In this particular case, it is showing the amount of the carbon and the sulphur deposited in the atmosphere. Say if I talk about the vehicle or maybe the waste products means like a exhaust gas what is coming from the vehicle itself, the amount deposited in the atmosphere is 8 billion tons. If we talk about the fossil fuels, it is about the 6.5 million tons. If we talk about the deforestation and the forest firing, it is cost around 1.5 million tons. So, now at present so many alternative fuels have been developed, still they are able to meet a small proportion of our actual demand. Yes, of course, because the solar energy or maybe the sunlight is the means uh, the quantity what we are getting is a huge. So, if we are able to develop certain technology where we can absorb the maximum solar energy, so that will be the very good for our near future. Because other these alternative fuels or maybe the fossil fuels what happen? Because they are having certain limitations. If I am having this much of quantity, I can generate this much of only the electricity, but the solar light it is countless almost. So, if I am able to construct certain kind of devices all over the world, so I can capture the whole sunlight and I can do use that particular sunlight for generating the electricity. That means, it is almost countless and the any number of productions we can do it. So, now in this particular image it has the data has been taken from the CEA MNRE. Uh, um, that is the Ministry of Renewable uh, Energy, Markham India Solar Project Tracker. So, they are telling that installed capacity of the solar energy in India till today. So, till 56.23 percentage basically we are depending upon the coal. If we talk about the hydro then it is 13.04 percentage, gas is 7.13 and nuclear is 1.94 percentage because the availability of the nuclear materials is very less. If we talk about the diesel, it is only 0.24 percent. Now, you can see that if we talk about the renewable energy, it is coming almost 21.41 percent, which is the second largest one just after the coal. So, now you can think that if in future the coal will be finished, so that time that area, that area can be taken care by the renewable energy. So, in future may be the renewable energy will be the 100 percent. So, now if we talk about the renewable energy that is also divided into several parts. So, basically if we talk about the wind energy, so just simple we can use certain kind of turbine and then wind uh, power or maybe the speed we rotate the turbine. So, then the turbine is rotating the generator and then it is generating the 9.93 percentage. If we talk about the solar, it is taking 7.46 percentage. If we use the biopower or maybe the biomaterials or maybe the biofuels, so that time it is 2.70 percentage. If we having the small hydro turbine plant, then we can generate up to 1.29 percentage. And of course, there is certain waste to power that is called the 0.04 percentage. So, now you can see that how tremendously the solar is coming up. So, maybe the solar energy can replace all other uh, non-conventional renewable energy in later future. Now, let us talk about the history of the solar energy. So, basically you can see in the year of 1839 by Edmond Becquerel, he has observed that materials which turn light into the energy. So, basically you can see that he has seen that the material uh, which can turn light to energy that means, if I am having certain materials, if I put the light over there then automatically it will generate the electricity or maybe the energy. So, basically he has started this one in the year of 1839, then followed by 1860 by Auguste Mauchot who has seen that direct conversion of solar radiations into the mechanical power. So, basically like this way slowly slowly we have come down to up to 1954 when the Fuller, Pearson and the Chaplin they discovered that silicon as a semiconductor with efficiency of 6 percent. Then later in 2009 that Miyasaka 
who has developed the peroxide materials into the solar cells. So, from this particular chart you can understand that first initially we have identified the materials where we can put the light and it can generate certain kind of energy. Then slowly slowly we have come to the silicon uh, solar systems. Then from silicon solar systems we have moved to the dye synthesized solar systems and nowadays people are trying to work on to the peroxide solar systems. So, basically uh, the materials we are changing just to achieve the more efficiency from the solar light. So, automatically still today the research is going on and hopefully maybe within certain years we can achieve near about 50 percent of the efficiency from the solar light. Now, what are the advantages of the solar energy? After the initial investment has been recovered, the energy from the sun is practically free of course, because first initial stage we have to set up the device and then that device can work for a longer time. So, a very less maintenance cost is required, only the initial startup cost is little bit higher. Then we talk about the financial incentives are available from the government that will reduce your cost. Yes, of course, now uh, in everywhere the uh, from the government like MNRE or maybe some other source they are putting the solar water heater or maybe some kind of solar panel with all the uh, government institutions or maybe the government offices. So, that at the roof whatever the solar energy uh, solar light basically we are wasting. So, by capturing the solar light and convert to it into the electricity. So, at the time of our normal electricity uh, off, maybe we can use that particular energy to solve the problems or maybe the uh, to uh, continue our experimentations or maybe running of the machines or maybe the running of the office buildings in the night time. Solar energy is also very clean renewable, sustainable and helping to protect our environment because this is almost the pollution free. Once installed there are no recurring costs, they operate silently have no moving parts. So, only you are having the collector where the sunlight is coming and then through that collector it is converting and into the from solar light to the so, uh, uh, electricity and then just that electricity we are storing into some device and then at the time of requirement just we are using that particular energy. There are of course, there are certain disadvantages of the solar energy also. The initial cost is the main disadvantage of installing a solar energy systems as I told already. So, that is why the government is giving so many types of incentives in terms of the loans or maybe the helping to the other uh, peoples for opening uh, their own business or maybe the startups. So, that they can install the solar energy and then after that slowly slowly when they are going to get certain profit and they are going to return it to the government or maybe the nationalized bank. Solar panels require quite large area for installations to achieve a good level of efficiency is yes, of course. Because uh, as I told already the efficiency is too less, maybe that time one solar panel or maybe the two solar panels will not be uh, good enough to generate the high amount of electricity. So, that time you need a larger area so that you can put so many solar panels and you can generate a quite uh, um, reasonable amount of the electricity at that particular time. Now, what are the classifications of the solar energy? So, basically the solar energy is divided into two parts, one is called the passive and one is called the active. So, if we talk about the active, active is also divided into two parts, one is called the solar thermal, another one is called the photovoltaics. And then solar thermal is like the concentrated solar thermal and photovoltaics is also divided into two parts, one is called the crystalline, another one is called the thin flames. Now, we are going to discuss one by one into the next subsequent slides. So, what is passive solar energy? So, basically from the name itself you can understand that this is passive, this is not directly active. So, basically passive solar energy is method in which solar energy is harnessed in its direct form without using any mechanical devices. So, suppose uh, you can understand in our childhood our mother used to put one bucket of water into the sunlight into the uh, at winter uh, time. Why? Because the thing is that after getting certain kind of sunlight that water can get little bit warm so that we can use it for our bath purpose. So, that is called the passive solar energy because here I am not going to use any kind of mechanical means 
directly I am using that particular solar energy into our systems. So, say suppose in the uh, uh, home or maybe the house or maybe the big building we are putting certain kind of glass opening uh, kind of things where the direct sunlight can come and heat at that particular room. We are having the passive solar cooling also say suppose direct sunlight is coming and we are passing the water through it and then the water is getting little bit heated up and then it is releasing certain kind of moisture so that we can uh, get it cool down. We are having some kind of passive solar heating kind of things where we can use directly the sunlight to heat inside the room. So, anyway we are not using any kind of mechanical device. So, directly we are using the solar light or maybe the sunlight into our system. Now, when you are talking about the active solar energy that means as I told already we are using certain kind of mechanism, we are using certain kind of machines to uh, store that particular solar energy so that it can convert into certain energy. How? So, the active solar energy employs mechanical or electrical equipment for functioning and increase system efficiency. As an example, water pumps are used to circulate water through the active solar energy water heating systems. Some application of active solar energy which can be very helpful to all of us is like this. What are those? First, in this particular case, we are having the active solar space heating. So, in this particular case, what you are seeing? The sunlight is coming on top of this panel and through this we are having, uh, the, we are passing the air through this particular channel. So, the air is getting inside in this through this channel and then it is coming out. So, when air is coming through due to that sunlight the air is heated up and then that heat air we are using inside uh, the room in winter time. So, like this way we are capturing the solar energy. In this particular case also we are nowadays we are using the active solar pool heating. So, in the winter times so with that we can use that particular uh, swimming pool because the water will getting warm over there. So, here is the another example where is the active solar water heating systems. So, it is also like that same instead of air just we are circulating the water through that particular panel. So, that water is getting heated up by the sunlight directly and then we are using that hot warm water for our daily purpose. Next, there are several types of active solar energy like that solar thermal energy. So, solar thermal power generation systems collect and concentrate sunlight to produce the high temperature heat needed to generate the electricity. All solar thermal power systems have solar energy collectors with two main components. One is called the reflectors that is nothing but the mirrors uh, that capture and focus sunlight onto a receiver. So, basically in most cases of system a heat transfer fluid is heated and circulated in the receiver and used to produce the steam. The steam is converted into mechanical energy in a turbine which powers a generator to produce the electricity. So, from this particular image we are trying to show that how basically we are generating the electricity. We are having that solar collector, we are having that reflector field. So, simple what is happening when the sunlight is coming the sunlight is reflecting onto the mirror. Then I am having the receiver over there. So, just I am rotating this one so that the full concentration of the sunlight will fall upon this one and inside it we are having that water or maybe some other means which will be heated up and then through that it will generate into the uh, vapor and through that vapor it will rotate the turbine and then turbine is coupled with the generator. So, automatically the generator will generate the electricity and that electricity we are sending to our day to day life. So, this is the basically the concept over here for the solar thermal energy. Next is called the photovoltaic solar cell energy. So, it is a one kind of battery kind of mechanisms. So, photovoltaic cell consists of two or more thin layers of semiconducting materials most commonly the silicon it is widely used. It is an electrical device that converts the energy of light directly into the electricity by the photovoltaic effect. So, the effect is called the photovoltaic. So, that is why it is called the photovoltaic solar cell energy basically the mechanism is known as the photovoltaic. So, photovoltaic is derived from the words photo, photo is the Greek meaning is having the light and the voltaic meaning is called the voltage. So, that means it is basically the light voltage. So, light is generating the potential difference over here. So, the basic operation of a semiconductor photovoltaic cell involves two steps, two steps 
one is called the absorption of light which leads to the generation of electron hole pairs within the photovoltaic materials. The separation of these electron hole pairs giving rise to an electrical current which flows in an external circuit. So, simple in this particular case you can see that in other words we can say that when the electron is moving from one place to another. So, what is happening here it was the electron. So, now here the electron is going into this place. So, automatically some vacant positions is creating at that particular point. So, the if the electron will go automatically the vacant will flow into the opposite directions. So, that is nothing but known as the electron hole pairs over there. So, that is creating the some kind of holes when the electron is leaving one place to another. So, now basically the classification of solar cell based on materials, there are several classifications. One is called the first generations, then second generations and the third generations. If we talk about the first generation solar cells, so basically it is divided into two parts. One is called the monocrystalline solar cells, another one is called the polycrystalline solar cells. If we talk about the second generations, we are having that amorphous silicon thin film solar cells, we are having that CDT, CIS, CIGS thin film solar cells, what are those I will tell you in brief. So, if we talk about the third generation solar cells, so first is called the organic solar cells, dye sensitized solar cells, quantum dot solar cells, nano crystalline based solar cells and last one the peroxide solar cells which we are going to discuss into our next lecture. So, first is called the first generation solar cells. So, first generation solar cells include single and the polycrystalline silicon materials. Here silicon which is first melted then crystallized into ingots or casting of pure silicon. Thin slides are cut to, to form a single crystals of silicon which is known as the monocrystalline or to form a block of silicon crystals which is nothing but the polycrystalline to make the individual cells. So, the conversion or efficiency for these cells range from 10 to 20 percent. So, in this particular case when you are talking about the mono, so basically mono case you see to make cells for monocrystalline panel silicon is formed into bars and cut into wafers. And when you are talking about the poly to make cells from polycrystalline panels fragments of silicon are melted together to form the wafers. So, in this case it is the one and poly means many. So, so many silicon crystals basically we are using. So, here is the more prominent image of the mono and the poly. Next we are going to talk about the second generation solar cells. So, basically these solar cells aims to use less material while maintaining the efficiencies of first generation photovoltaics. So, basically they involves the amorphous silicon that cadmium telluride, copper indium dicellurite copper indium gallium dicellurite. So, basically ASI, CDT and CIGS absorb the solar spectrum much more efficiently than single crystalline silicon and use only 1 to 10 micrometer thickness of active materials. So, here from this particular line you can understand that we need a less amount of material. Thin film technology is less expensive since it uses fewer materials and less manufacturing process. So, if we talk about the amorphous silicon where basically we are putting that particular materials. So, in this particular case you can see that we are having that metal back contact then top of that we are putting one interlayer and in this particular case basically we are using the amorphous silicon and then we are having that front contact TCO and the glass super straight. So, like this way basically in this particular case we are using the CDT absorber, in this particular case basically we are using the CIGS absorber. So, from this you can understand that almost the manufacturing process is almost same only basically we are changing the materials just to increase the efficiency. Next we are going to discuss about the amorphous silicon thin films, what is that? Amorphous silicon has limited short range order, so its physics is complete completely different from that of the crystalline silicon. With the development of nanotechnology we can create homogeneous layer of amorphous silicon to absorb the short wavelength photons. Periodical amorphous silicon nanorod structures for light trapping enhancement for longer wavelength photons. 
nano cone amorphous silicon structure to improve carrier collection efficiency. So, basically you can see that we are having that glass substrate on top of that we are putting some metallic back reflector and the contact and then we are having that n type silicon, i type silicon and the p type silicon. And next we are having that transparent conductive oxide and again we are having that glass. So, basically the solar cell is coming. So, in this particular case the electron is jumping from here to here p type to the n type 1. When the electron is jumping automatically you can see the whole pair is creating in this particular case. So, now when the electron is coming whole pair. So, automatically now the electron in other way when it is going to that it will make the balance. So, that is why the current is flowing from here to here. Next we are having that cadmium telluride thin flame cells. So, in short generally we are calling it as a CDTE. So, is a polycrystalline semiconductor material made from cadmium and tellurium. CDTE has a high light absorbity level that is only about 1 micrometer thick semiconductor can absorb 90 percent of the solar spectrum. Now, you can understand in our last lecture if you see properly. So, you can see that we are having 1 to 10 micrometer, but in this particular case you can see that only we are using the 1 micrometer thick systems and it can absorb the 90 percent of the solar spectrum. So, CDT tails have been fabricated by physical deposition, spraying, screen printing followed by sintering and electro depositions. Of course, there is certain disadvantages, what is that? Cadmium is a toxic heavy metal can pollute the environment if the cell is damaged or maybe the broken. That means, if the cadmium can come into the contact with the air, so that time it creates certain kind of pollutions to the environment. So, the same like it is the amorphous silicon, in this case only we are replacing the amorphous silicon by the CDT material. Next, we are having that CIS and CIGS thin flame solar cells. So, CIS is a polycrystalline semiconductor material composed of C stands for copper, I stands for indium and S stands for selenium. So, basically it is the copper indium diselenide. So, CIS cells are most light absorbent semiconductor compounds absorbing up to 90 percent of the solar spectrum. CIGS copper indium gallium diselenide is multi layered thin flame composite materials. The addition of small amounts of the compound gallium to CIS produce a photovoltaic cell with a higher conversion efficiency. That means, the people every day they are researching on it that which type of materials if I add into the system so that it can increase the efficiency of that particular system. So, in number of researchers are working on nowadays on this particular solar photovoltaic system. So, in this particular case in this here basically we are using the CIS or maybe the CIGS absorbing materials. Next come to the last one which is called the third generation solar cells. It is also divided into several parts. So, basically the third generation solar cells are solution processable solar cells with excellent potential for large scale solar electricity generation. These solar cells are using small molecules like quantum dots or maybe the wires, quantum wells or maybe the super lattice technologies. Organic and disensitized solar cells are often categorized in the third generation solar cell group. Third generation solar cell technologies are at the research and pre-commercial stage because yes, I will show you some literature into the next lecture that now how the people are working and how they are trying to improve the efficiency of those kind of materials. Basically, third generation solar cells pursue more efficiency more abundant materials, non-toxic materials and the durability of that particular systems. So, types of third generation solar cells number one is called the organic photovoltaic cell. So, basically organic photovoltaic cell in short basically we are calling it as a OPV devices convert solar energy to electrical energy. A typical OPV device consists of one or several photoactive materials sandwiched between two electrodes. So, basically it is a sandwich structure. Structure of organic solar cells is like this in a bi layer OPV cell sunlight is absorbed in the, into the photovoltaic layers composed of donor and acceptor semiconducting organic materials to generate the 
photo current. So, in this particular image just to see we are having that sunlight and then top of that uh, we are having that anode. We are having that donor layer, acceptor layer, buffer layer and the cathode. So, in this particular case what happened? The donor material donates electrons and mainly the transport holes, acceptor material withdraws electrons and mainly transport electrons. So, like this way basically we are getting the electricity. So, in this particular case donor layer is giving the protons which is coming to the anode and then in this particular case at the acceptor level is gives the electrons and it is going to the buffer layer and to the cathode itself and then automatically one is minus full of electron, one is the positive one that is the full of proton and then automatically the current is passing from the minus to the plus. Next mechanism in organic photovoltaic solar cells. So, basically photoactive materials harvest photons from sunlight to form the exciton in which electrons are excited from the valence band into the conduction band which is nothing but the known as the light absorption. Due to the concentration gradient the exciton diffused to the donor or maybe the acceptor interface like exciton diffusion and separate into free holes positive charge carriers and electrons like negative charge carriers basically this mechanism is known as called the charge separation. So, a photovoltaic is generated when the holes and electrons move to the corresponding electrodes by following either donor or acceptor phase which is nothing but known as the charge extraction. So, why basically we are using the organic solar cell? So, it is very easy to processing, it is having the very good mechanical flexibility, it is economically viable, it is very safe to the environment. So, that means it does not create any kind of pollutions to the in environment, less expensive than the inorganic materials like silicon. So, in this particular case we can see that we have given the examples that how we are doing light absorptions, then exact exciton diffusion, then charge separation and the charge extraction how it is taking place. So, simple it is creating the electron hole pair the, when the electron is moving then we are having two collectors when one is collecting the protons when is collecting the electrons and then the automatically the current is moving from one side and then in the loop also the electron is coming back to its original positions. So, like this way they are making the balance inside the systems and we are getting the continuous electricity and here basically what the sunlight is doing it is agitating that materials to leave the electron. Next we are having the dye sensitized solar cells till today uh, maximum cases we are using this means uh, maximum applications basically we are using the dye sensitized solar cells. So, basically the dye sensitized solar cells in short DSSC or maybe the Gradzel cells named after the Swiss chemist Michael Gradzel who was greatly involved in the development of new cell types. Manufacturing of DSSCs is simple, mostly low cost and incorporate environmentally friendly materials. They have a good efficiency about 10 to 14 percent even under low flux of sunlight. So, that means if you are having that little bit cloudy weather also, so by using that materials you can generate the sunlight. However, a major drawback is the temperature sensitivity of the liquid electrolyte. Hence, a lot of research is going on to improve the electrolyte's performance and the cell stability. So, what is the mechanism in the dye sensitized solar cells? So, the step one is that the dye molecule is initially in its ground state. The semiconductor material of the anode is at, at this energy level near the valence band non-conductive. So, when light shines on the cell, dye molecules get excited from their ground state to a higher energy state. So, simple it is coming from here to here. So, that means S after getting the sunlight it is moving into the A star. So, basically the A star is nothing but the excited dye molecules having the higher energy content and overcomes the band gap of the semiconductor. The next step the excited dye molecules is oxidized and an electron is injected into the conduction band of the semiconductor. Electrons can now move freely as the semiconductor is conductive at this energy level. So, S, S star is 
converting into the S plus and it is releasing one electron to the systems. Now, electrons are then transported to the current collector of the anode via the diffusion process and electrical load can be powered if connected. What is the step 3? The oxidized dye molecules S plus which is generating from here is again regenerated by electron donation from the iodide in the electrolyte. So, that means S plus plus 3 by 2 I minus then again it is become stable. So, that means it is ready to again become the S plus for next time. In return iodide is regenerated by reduction of triiodide on the cathode itself. So, half I 3 minus plus when it is taking the electron it is becoming this materials which is helping to form the again sulfur over there. So, it is from the again S, S a stable S atom over there. So, in this particular case you can see that we are having that FTO glass and we are having that platinum counter electrode over there. So, here it has been clearly shown that how the electron flow is taking place over there. If I put the load over there, so I can simply collect the electricity from this particular point. So, in this particular case I am having the disynthesized titanium dioxide flame. So, here in this particular case S is nothing but the titanium. So, basically. So, what is happening over there? So, sensitizer die. So, S plus or maybe the S minus like this way it is coming from here to here. So, you see actually this green. So, when the green is going into this and then it is coming I minus and maybe the I 3 minus and then it is moving to this. So, actually it is starting from here it is going into this and in this particular case it is coming over here it is coming and just to stabilize these particular things over there. So, like this way from both the sides it is coming the material is stabilizing into the between, but the electron is flowing from my FTO glass to the PT counter or maybe the platinum counter electrode. Next is called the quantum dot solar cells. So, quantum dots are used as the light absorbing photovoltaic material in solar cells. Quantum dots have the advantage of tuning its properties by changing the size of the nanoparticles. Yes, because this size you can see dots, dots means what? Nothing, it is a ball kind of shapes. So, uh, we while doing the synthesis basically we can control the shape of that particular ball. We can make it smaller, we can make it bigger also. This allows them to be easily fabricated to absorb the different parts of the solar spectrum making room for efficient harvesting of near infrared photons. Quantum dot solar cells use solution process nanocrystals and are useful for their integration into various solar cells. So, simple we are having that materials slowly slowly we are taking out layer by layer and then after that the smallest part basically we are getting as a quantum dots. So, major challenges include inadequate understanding of surface chemistry of the quantum dots. So, basically you can see we are having the titanium dioxide flame over there and below that we are using the quantum dot layer such as the lead sulphide or maybe the lead celeride or maybe the cadmium sulphide or maybe the cadmium celeride. So, these all are the materials where we are using the quantum dots of these kind of materials and basically we are using the below of the TiO2 flame. We are having that transparent conducting electrode, then we are having that blocking layer, we are having that counter electrode in this particular case. So, what is happening? The electron is moving from here to here and the proton is moving from here to here. It is the conducting electrode will become the minus and then the counter electrode will become the plus. So, automatically the current will flow in this particular case. Next is known as the nanocrystalline based solar cells. So, basically the fullerenes it is a one form of the carbon right. So, have mostly sparked interest as n type semiconductor materials in organic field effect transistors FET, organic photovoltaic cells. Fullerenes help electrons travel further in organic solar cells. So, basically the carbon nanotubes are used in the preparation of counter electrodes in DSSC disensitized solar cell and transparent electrode in OPV organic photovoltaics. 
So, basically graphene based ultra thin films can be used as a new low cost front electrode material for photovoltaic devices. The unique geometry of nanoware arrays can allow for low optical reflection and enhance the light trapping and absorption within nanoware arrays. So, that means the people are working, these all are the latest materials. Now, people are working on these materials just to increase the efficiency, uh, decrease the cost and automatically the increase the life of those particular solar cells, so that we can use it for a longer time. Now, come to the comparison of first, second and third generation of the solar cells. So, technology wise first generation is the wafer based, second generation is the thin film based and third generation is also the thin film based. If I talk about the advantages, so first generation we are having that high quality, low defect, high efficiency. If we talk about the second generations, low material utilizations and the lower cost, that means cost has been reduced. Third generations, it is non-toxic, it is abundant materials using low cost, transparent, short payback. And if we talk about the disadvantages, first generations we are having that high consumption of active silicon. If we talk about the second generations, scarcity of toxicity of some materials and if we talk about the third generations, it is optimizing the lifetime efficiency and cost rate off. So, automatically now in the third generations basically we are standing. So, in this particular case basically we are trying to increase the efficiency as well as it will be the low cost. Next use of the nanotechnology for harvesting the solar energy. So, basically the nanotechnology is a powerful tool for the host of the solar system in support of efficient sustainable energy conversion, storage and conservation in terms of tailoring the interaction of light with materials and enabling the processing of low cost semiconductors into device such as photovoltaics, making more efficient photocatalysts for converting sunlight into chemical fuels, developing new materials and membranes for the separation needed in many energy applications, converting chemical fuels into electrical energy and of course, the vice versa one improving the energy and power density in batteries. So, simple nanotechnology, what does it mean? That means, we are dealing the technology with some nanomaterials. What is nanomaterials? It is nothing but the 10 to the power minus 9 meter. So, automatically when I am using certain kind of light absorbing materials or maybe like any kind of electrode or maybe any kind of hole transport layer or maybe the electron transport layer, that material basically we are making like a composite. So, in that composites we are using certain kind of filler materials which size is into the nanometer range or maybe the nano scale. So, basically nowadays the people are tending on to this because due to that uh, high surface to the volume ratio. So, nano materials is very good, it is having some outstanding properties. Basically, if we are able to nurture those materials into the nano levels and people are using like nanoparticles, nanofibers, carbon nanotubes, nano seeds, graphene, quantum dots. So, these all are the different types of examples from the nanotechnology point of view. Next, on which basis basically we are going to choose that whether this nanomaterials is good for the solar energy, solar energy harvesting systems or not. So, the ideal candidate materials to be used in solar cells should possess proper band gap so, basically 1.0 to 1.8 electron volt to harvest the maximum sunlight. So, the gap should be like this, so that the electron can easily jump from one layer to another layer. So, valence band to conduction band, good charge transport property, excellent stability and the of course, the cheap cost. Now, there are several types of applications where nowadays we are using the solar energy directly or maybe the indirectly. So, charging of the electronic devices, now you can see that we are having the charger which is powered by the solar panel. So, directly the sunlight is coming, it is generating the electricity through that we can charge our gadgets. We are having that supplying the power to the house. So, top roof, basically we are putting the solar panels over there. We are having that power source to the outdoor devices, power to the satellites, that is the best examples nowadays we are using. Solar powered vehicles, solar powered aeroplane, but just think one that 
I have given only the six examples, but there are n number of examples are there by which basically we are using the solar energy. Not only that, we are using the solar energy to the automobiles, to the ships, to the marines, everywhere nowadays we are using the solar energy directly so that we can get the electricity at the time of scarcity. Now, we have come to the last slide of this particular lecture. So, in summary, we can say that to reduce the pollution from fossil fuels, the world is working on renewable energy sources out of all solar energy is on top of the list. So, basically what is happening? We are moving from fossil fuels and petroleum fuels to the renewable solar energy. Photovoltaic cell converts the light energy into electricity directly by the photovoltaic effect. First generation solar cell energy use single and polycrystalline silicon material. Second generation solar cells are thin film based and uses less materials means consumption of materials is less. Third generation solar cells are still in research and pre-commercial stage. Carbon nanotubes and graphene are used in making electrodes in solar cells. Also we are using the graphene quantum dots or maybe different types of quantum dots. Nanomaterials are used to enhance the light capturing from the sun and enhance the performance of the solar cells. Thank you.